Chinese history is filled with countless battles and wars, and as we read about these events, one city is mentioned again and again: Xuzhou, also known as Pengcheng. Just about any time that China has been divided, important battles inevitably take place at or near the city. But what is so special anyway about a city that is otherwise just located in the middle of a large plain? In this video, let us explore the reasons that make Xuzhou the most fought-after city in China. We can divide the history of Xuzhou into three time periods, during each of which it played different roles on the Chinese geopolitical map. The first period, which was very much a golden age for Xuzhou, took place from the early days of Chinese history to 1194, the year the Yellow River flooded and began to flow past the city. The second period, during which Xuzhou underwent a slump in its fortunes, went from 1194 to the early 20th century until the first railroads were built through it. And the final period is from the early 20th century to the present day. And before continuing with the video, we should also clarify the name of the city. The earlier, more traditional name of the city was Pengcheng, literally the city of Peng, and the name Xuzhou did not become widely used for this city until the Tang Dynasty, which ruled China from 618 to 907. And so, for this video, I will switch between Pengcheng and Xuzhou depending on the time period. Xuzhou is located in a region known as the Central Plains, which generally refers to the flat central area in northern China between the Yellow River and the Huai River. The Central Plains itself has little natural defenses, but it connects various peripheral, much more defensible regions to one another. Historically, there were three such regions that were especially popular with warring factions. The first was the northwest, especially the Wei River Valley around the ancient capital of Chang'an, modern-day Xi'an, that was well protected by mountains. The second was Hebei, literally north of the Yellow River. Militarily, the most important city in the region has traditionally been Beijing because it protected the northern entrance to the North China Plain, and as such, those who controlled Beijing automatically had access to a large, battle-hardened army. The third was the southeast around the Yangtze River Delta, which, for almost all of Chinese history, was the main population center in the south and well protected from the north by the Yangtze and Huai rivers. Any time a faction based out of one of these three key regions wanted to fight each other, they almost inevitably had to pass through the Central Plains near the location of Xuzhou. Now let us zoom in to focus on the Central Plains between the Yellow River to the north and the Huai River to the south. Although the Central Plains is very flat, a large number of rivers do flow through it. Mostly in a northwest to southeast direction, as tributaries of the Huai River. In ancient times, these rivers were widely used for navigation, and many of them were connected with one another via canals to form a dense water transportation network between the Yellow and Huai Rivers. Of these rivers, the Si River was a particularly important north-south artery. Xuzhou sat on the west bank of the Si River, at the point where the Bian River fed into it. The Bian River, in turn, was often connected via canals to the Yellow. River from Xuzhou, one could travel up the Bian River to the ancient capitals of Luoyang and Chang'an, or up and down the Si River along much of the coast of eastern China. In addition to the nearby river network, Xuzhou also occupied one of the few locations in the Central Plains with actual mountains and hills, making it one of the few easily defensible cities on the open plains. The region around Xuzhou was also covered with fertile, well-irrigated farmlands and densely populated, all while holding large reserves of copper, iron, and coal, vital resources for building an army, along with easy access to the nearby salt flats on the coast that produce large quantities of salt. Another key ancient military resource, and finally, according to traditional Chinese stereotypes, the wealthier a region is, the less likely it is to produce good soldiers. But Xuzhou was one of the few places that defied this rule by being both wealthy and having a reputation for a strong local military culture. And so, although an army could technically bypass Xuzhou by taking any one of the river routes southwest of Xuzhou, such as the Ru, Ying, or Guo rivers, it was often impractical to do so. Because Xuzhou had access to so much natural resources and was so well defended from attacks, an army, especially a cavalry force based out of Xuzhou, could easily cut off the supply lines of any army that tried to bypass it. To put all of these factors together, whoever controlled Xuzhou controlled the Central Plains, and whoever controlled the Central Plains controlled China. In the early days of Chinese history, around 1000 BC. 
the Zhou people, based out of the Wei River Valley in the northwest, conquered the Shang Dynasty that ruled further east. The nascent Zhou Dynasty established a number of feudal states to colonize and assimilate the vast newly conquered eastern territories, and two important states were placed near the Si River against the local inhabitants there, who were still considered to be barbarians. The first state was Lu, with its capital upstream along the Si River at Qufu. Lu would eventually become the home state of Confucius, and the Si River would become closely associated with his legacy. One of Confucius's best known quotes, Time flows away like the water of the river, refers to the Si River. The other state was Song, with its capital at nearby Shangqiu, also known as Suiyang, on the north bank of the Sui River, another tributary of the Si River. Both Lu and Song tried to expand their influence down the Si River, although it was Song that established a settlement at Pengcheng, eventually moving its capital there. In the first half of the 200s BC, the basin of the Si River, including Pengcheng, was conquered by the southern state of Chu, a super state with its core territories in the mid Yangtze region. But in 278 BC, these core territories were conquered by the western state of Qin, and large numbers of the Chu elites were forced to relocate eastward. Shouchun, on the south bank of the Huai River, became the new capital of Chu, and the basin of the Huai and Si rivers, including Pengcheng, became its new core territories. The state of Qin would go on to brutally conquer Chu in 223 BC, and then the rest of China a few years later in 221 BC. The king of Qin declared himself the first emperor of China, establishing the Qin dynasty. Qin dynasty rule did not last long. Shortly after the death of the first emperor in 210 BC, massive rebellions by the conquered peoples broke out across China. Two key rebel leaders were Xiang Yu and Liu Bang, both of whom came from the region around Pengcheng. After the rebels overthrew the Qin dynasty in 207 BC, Xiang Yu, the most powerful of the rebel generals, reestablished the prior political order of feudal states that had been abolished by the Qin dynasty. Xiang Yu kept the largest state for himself and gave himself the title the Hegemon King of West Chu, with his capital at Pengcheng. The other states soon began to rebel against Xiang Yu. In 206 BC, Liu Bang, the king of Han, led an allied army supposedly 560,000 strong to capture Pengcheng, while Xiang Yu was away campaigning further to the north, only for Xiang Yu to hurry back with 30,000 light cavalry and rout the allied army in one of the greatest victories of his career. Over the next few years, the front line stabilized in the western part of the central plains. But gradually, Liu Bang either defeated or won over the support of most of the other feudal states, such that the position of Xiang Yu became increasingly precarious. In December 203 BC, Liu Bang launched one last great offensive against Xiang Yu from multiple directions. Pengcheng was captured from behind, cutting off Xiang Yu's escape route to the east and south, and eventually Xiang Yu's army was cornered and surrounded on the open plains at Gaixia, somewhere to the southwest of Pengcheng, although its exact location has been lost to history. As the situation of the Chu army became more desperate, one night the Han soldiers began to sing songs from Chu for the Chu soldiers to hear, leading them to mistakenly believe that all of Chu had been conquered by Han. Morale in Xiang Yu's army collapsed, and Xiang Yu had little choice but to lead 800 elite troops to break out of the encirclement. He was pursued by Han forces, and by the time he reached the north bank of the Yangtze River, all that was left of his army were him and 28 other soldiers. Even though he still had the chance to cross the Yangtze River to attempt to make a comeback, he refused to do so. He and his band of followers fought on until he was the only man left standing, and then he killed himself. The Battle of Gaixia was the origin of a famous idiom, Si Mian Chu Ge, to be surrounded by Chu songs on all sides, meaning to be in a desperate situation surrounded by enemies. The death of Xiang Yu was one of the most famous events in Chinese history, although geographically, the fact that Xiang Yu was put in the position to even be surrounded by Chu songs on all sides to begin with demonstrates a key weakness of Pengcheng. Yes, it was located in a very wealthy region with strong natural defenses, but none of this changes the fact that it was still located on the open plains, and enemies could attack it from all directions. For this reason, it typically made much more sense for warlords to set up their home bases somewhere else, and to simply use Pengcheng as a forward base of operations. After the defeat of Xiang Yu, no major faction ever dared to make Pengcheng its capital ever again. 
Liu Bang went on to establish the Han Dynasty, which ruled China for 400 years until it fell apart in the late 100s AD in events described in the novel The Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And China entered a period of division that lasted until 589. For much of this period, China was split between north and south. The frontier typically sat along the Huai River, the natural boundary between the two regions, and as long as the Huai River remained the border, the two sides were typically in stalemate. But what if either side wanted to gain a strategic advantage over the other? Well then, Pengcheng would become a major target. If the north wanted to invade the south, then realistically there were only three routes for it to do so. The first was the far eastern route down the Si River through Pengcheng, and then the Hangou Canal into the Yangtze River. The second was a more central route from the central plains along rivers such as the Ru and Ying towards the Huai, but as long as the south controlled Pengcheng, then it could easily cut off the supply lines of this army. The final route was to sail down the Han River and then the Yangtze River, but because the political center of the south was all the way east in the Yangtze River Delta, it would have been nearly impossible for a northern fleet to reach the Yangtze River Delta without having at least some military presence north of the Yangtze. And for that, it still needed to cross the Huai River, and for that, it still needed to control Pengcheng. But if the north were to control Pengcheng, then it could set up its cavalry there and use the city as a forward base to launch raids southward, or build up an infantry presence there and slowly encroach on southern territories, all without having to worry about being harassed by the southern navy patrolling the Si River. Likewise, if the south were to invade the north, it lacked the draft animals needed to pull supply wagons, and also risked fighting the northern cavalry on the open plains. Instead, the best option would be to utilize its superior navy to transport troops and grains along the rivers and canals as far north as possible, with Pengcheng being a key hub in this network. A recurrent theme in Chinese military history has been that the North was better suited for cavalry warfare, whereas the South was better suited for naval warfare. Pengcheng was one of the few places that was well suited for both. In 416, the Eastern Jin Dynasty was on its last breath, with its government under the control of the general Liu Yu. Northern China at the time was split between multiple barbarian states, especially later Qin, with its capital at Chang'an, and Northern Wei, based north of the Yellow River. Liu Yu decided to invade later Qin, but how do you take an army from the Yangtze River Delta all the way to the northwest? With a navy, of course, even if a southern navy has hardly ever ventured this far from home. In late 416, Liu Yu organized a multi-pronged attack against later Qin, with him personally leading an army up the Si River to Pengcheng, through another canal connecting the Si River to the Ji River, then down the Ji River via another canal to the Yellow River, and then up the Yellow River to the heart of later Qin territory. The Yellow River was poorly suited for navigation, so Liu Yu had to rely on large numbers of burlaks to pull his ships up river. Along the way, they were harassed by Northern Wei cavalrymen, until Liu Yu sent an army across the Yellow River to fight them off for good. In 417, Liu Yu's soldiers made it all the way to the walls of Chang'an by boat, after which they disembarked, defeated the defenders, and conquered the later Qin dynasty. The military glory that Liu Yu gained from this expedition gave him the influence to usurp the throne a few years later in 420. Liu Yu's ancestors also came from Pengcheng, where the ancient state of Song had been located, and so he named his dynasty Song, known in history as the Liu Song dynasty. The Northern Wei dynasty went on to unify northern China over the ensuing decades, and soon it was the North's turn to invade the South. In 450, Emperor Tai Wu of Northern Wei personally led an army against Pengcheng, but the city was so well defended that he was forced to lift the siege to ride further south. A southern army 10,000 strong under a general named Zhang Zhi was sent north to relieve Pengcheng, but in route to Pengcheng, it ran head-on into the Northern Wei cavalry and was ripped to shreds. Zhang Zhi led the survivors to set up defenses at the nearby city of Xuyi. The Northern Wei army rode all the way to the north bank of the Yangtze, looting, burning, and massacring everything in its path. The southern emperor stood on top of the walls of his capital at Jiankang and looked helplessly across the Yangtze at the gathered Northern Wei army. But with the supply lines overextended, the Northern Wei army was eventually forced to return home. As his army passed by Xuyi, Emperor Tai Wu demanded that the defender send him a gift of wine as a symbolic act of submission. But Zhang Zhi sent him a jug of urine instead. Emperor Tai Wu lost his head and ordered an all-out attack against Xuyi, which still held on firmly after a month of brutal fighting. 
Finally, fearful that the army at Pengcheng could cut off his retreat route, Emperor Taiwu swallowed his pride and went home. Without controlling Pengcheng, it was simply not possible for the north to hold on to its conquests. The division between north and south lasted until 589, when the Sui dynasty finally conquered the south to unify China. During the Sui dynasty and the ensuing Tang dynasty, Pengcheng remained a key military base, especially since the newly constructed Grand Canal, which brought precious grain shipments from the Yangtze River Delta to the capital at Chang'an, passed nearby. It was a key military base protecting the Tang dynasty during the cataclysmic Anlushan Rebellion from 755 to 763. Although the main engagement in the region did not take place there, but rather at nearby Suiyang in 757 along the Grand Canal, where a long siege led to mass organized cannibalism to take place in the city. The importance of Pengcheng, which we should now refer to as Xuzhou, dramatically changed starting in the 1100s, when frequent flooding of the Yellow River caused it to change course and occupy the riverbed of the Lower Si River, flow past Xuzhou, and then into the Huai River. This remained the course of the Yellow River until 1853, when it again reverted back to its usual northerly course. Now, you would think that having a major river like the Yellow River flow past Xuzhou would be a huge boom for the city, but it was actually the opposite. The lower Yellow River is highly prone to flooding and poorly suited for navigation, so its presence significantly messed up navigation in the region, which also went from one of the wealthiest regions in China to a disaster-prone, depopulated area with degraded soils. The silt deposited by the Yellow River also gradually flattened the mountains around Xuzhou, making them less militarily useful than before. Additionally, a big reason for Xuzhou's prior importance was that it was located in the center of the central plains, and so had a large land area to project its influence towards. But with the Yellow River now flowing much further south, the size of the central plains also decreased, and Xuzhou was no longer in the center of the region, but out in the periphery. The decline of Xuzhou during this period also corresponded with the decline of the northwest, centered around Chang'an, as a major player in Chinese politics. Xuzhou, instead of being located at the intersection of three important regions, was now just a stopping point along the north-south axis linking Beijing to the Yangtze River Delta. But with this said, Xuzhou did still retain some importance since it was located at the intersection of the Yellow River and the rebuilt Grand Canal, and any army that wanted to travel between north and south still needed to pass through the choke point created by the mountains around Xuzhou. Xuzhou finally regained some of its prior importance in the early 20th century when the first railroads were built in China. Two major railroads, a north-south railroad connecting Beijing to the Yangtze River and an east-west railroad connecting the northwest to the sea both passed through the city, and it became one of the most important railway junctions in China. When Japan invaded China in 1937 during the Second Sino-Japanese War, which eventually merged with the rest of World War II, the Japanese initially attacked via two routes, a northern route through Beijing, then known as Beiping, and a southern route through Shanghai towards the nationalist Chinese capital at Nanjing, hoping for a quick victory. But as the war dragged on into 1938 and the nationalist Chinese government relocated its capital westward to Wuhan, the Japanese launched an offensive towards Xuzhou in March 1938 to connect their northern and southern occupation zones. The Nationalist Army organized a strong defense of Xuzhou, initially defeating the Japanese at the Battle of Taerzhuang, but was eventually forced to retreat westward by May 1938 as the Japanese closed in from both north and south across the open plains along the railroad. After capturing Xuzhou, the Japanese ideally would have then attacked westward along the railroad to Zhengzhou and then southward along the railroad to Wuhan. But before this plan could materialize, the Nationalists blew up the dam on the Yellow River, and the ensuing flood prevented the Japanese from advancing further west. This act remains controversial in China for various reasons. The tremendous loss of life, the lack of effort to minimize civilian casualties, and whether it was even necessary to blow up the dam in the first place. The enmity between the Communists and Nationalists have only made this controversy worse. But regardless of later controversies, in the immediate aftermath of the flooding, the Japanese could no longer attack Wuhan through the central plains and had to make do with a much more mountainous route up the Yangtze River. Although they did eventually succeed in capturing Wuhan by October 1938, they also ran out of steam, leading to stalemate. Shortly after World War II ended in 1945, the communists and nationalists renewed their civil war against one another, and Xuzhou, for the most recent time, became the site of a key battle. By late 1948, the communists were ascendant in the northeast and north, and the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek shifted its priority to defending the capital at Nanjing in the Yangtze River Delta against the communists, with Xuzhou being the focal point of the defense. 
The ensuing battle is referred to by the communists as the Huaihai Campaign, with Huai referring to the Huai River and Hai referring to Haizhou, the eastern terminus of the east-west railroad through Xuzhou, and by the nationalists as the Battle of Xubeng, with Xu referring to Xuzhou and Beng referring to the nearby railway town of Bengbu on the south bank of the Huai River. In November 1948, the communists proactively launched an attack against Xuzhou, which was located in a salient, and by January 1949 had enveloped and destroyed five nationalist field armies in the region, and soon afterwards pushed all the way to the north bank of the Yangtze River with minimal resistance, paving the way for the communists to easily take almost all of mainland China within a year of the battle.